World Health Organization has created healthcare in various countries, and France, surprisingly, is number one. The European countries are way ahead of the United States, and they're all doing primary care, and they have broken the countries in primary care. And the specialist doesn't get called in until a good deal later than the United States, whereas a person with medical assistance in the United States can get a specialist with uh, medical assistance. So um, I think uh, there ought to be an effort to learn about uh, primary care in other countries and find out what's good about Okay. Thanks. Well, real quickly, uh, from my vantage point, as, uh, as a journalist, is one of the problems that I see out there is the conversation that happens socially around medication. And by that I mean it's this one size fits all. Eight percent of people think depression is caused by the serotonin, etc. And that begets a system where there is no lot of conversation or a lot of sort of use of drugs. It becomes this go on your drug, keep on the drug, etc. And that's not a very nuanced or thoughtful approach, but that's the conversation that most people get when they hit the system in front of their kid. Mm -hmm. And what you hear today is what's needed is a much more thoughtful conversation at various points. When you go on, you said that, that you don't initially put people on. That's a good conversation. That in it, like it's or whatever, they've lost a job or they've got some problem at their home. In other words, you need a conversation at that first moment, maybe cognitive therapy, but that's not happening. You mentioned that maybe after six months, there's plenty of reason to have tapering. That's a conversation that needs to happen. Will also mentioned that some people find a way where they use the meds sporadically to figure when something's coming off. Court and Harding study found many people with schizophrenia. That's the way they use antipsychotics. So my plea here is that the conversation that drives the use of medications now is this sort of simplistic, one size fits all. And it doesn't really engender a lot of listening to, say, a, a person who might want to come off with support. And I think the conversation has to change. That's what's in the best way to do That uh, keep in mind the need to provide comprehensive care. By comprehensive, I imply bio, psycho, social, cultural, and spiritual. Uh, the recovery persons, what is the role of recovery persons? It has been said many times. Sharing their experience, teaching with the uh, uh, public, and for that, uh, the means, the, the media have uh, the power to go, uh, play a power to go, and uh, of course, they need to empower uh, uh, their peers uh, to be part of the decision making. Recommendations, education, comprehe comprehensiveness of care, the general recommendations in the education of the primary care and public, etc., comprehensiveness of care as a goal, and uh, the uh, ability uh, to recognize that it's different treatment options exist. <laughs> um, I had a few thoughts, and, and one of them, most of what we've talked about is uh, about what happens when people get in the door of primary care, but we haven't talked much about what happens before people get in the door, and you know, things are such that many people never get in the door. They're kind of, you know, below the, the level of the iceberg, you know. Um, and I, I think that given what Pat was saying about the whole issue of self-care and what goes on before people get to um, a physician's office, I think we need to be conscious of it. I think some people in the community may be engaging in self-care and not even realize it, that what they're doing may be valuable. And, um, and for those who have unmet mental health needs, they may not know it either. People like Margarita Alvaria talk about sort of patient activation. I mean, when do people realize that they need help and come forward? So I'm wondering if there's some public education that needs to take place about that. And that's the pre-medication discussion, but I think it can be protective for people even ending up in the medication scene if that's not appropriate and, and really maximizing some of the self-care. And I think that is also resonant with um, prevention that is supposed to be a big part of what healthcare reform is all about. Secondly, um, I, I participated in something um, that the Office of Minority Health um, sponsored focusing on uh, health, mental health, behavioral health in, Af in the African American community. And what came out of that was a report that talked about pathways to integrated care. 
and that people didn't really want to focus on mental health. I mean, they did talk about recovery, but um, the, the concepts of wellness, integration that includes not only general medical care, mental health, behavioral health, but also oral health as well, because all of these things are connected. Um, and the, the, the concepts of wellness um, may not necessarily uh, include medication. And so these are things, these are, these are assumptions that we tend to make that we need to kind of disentangle uh, and focus on the, the wellness piece, um, because that's something that um, people in the community resonate towards more than mental health or any of the labels that we're so stuck on. Thirdly, this came up a little bit in the conversation earlier, um, there's been the use of mental health navigators, peer counselors, in primary care for people with mental health needs. And I've heard about um, some of these types of approaches, um, particularly with culturally diverse populations, and it's been very effective utilizing um, peer counselors and groups for um, African American women with depression and their people are getting good results from that. And some of these um, community health workers, so to speak, can serve as cultural brokers and this can help kind of bridge the divide when there are cross-cultural mm -hmm. differences between mm -hmm. the system, the provider, um, and the, um, the person receiving services. Um, and then finally, um, NIMH, um, I read recently, came out with um, a series <coughs> of, a list of grand challenges for global health, and one of them, um, one of the top 10, I think, was the mental health training of providers of general medical care, which is kind of what we've been talking about. So I just wanted to emphasize that this is not just um, a challenge and an interest for our country, but worldwide it's being recognized um, that there needs to be more research and more um, focus on that piece. That's a lot. Thank you. Peggy? Well, I, I think I, I just encourage us to go back to some of the paper. And um, my, my mantra is in the paper, wellness and good health matter. <laughs> wellness and good health matter. matter. Mm -hmm. Just like they said in the Surgeon General's report, that <coughs> mental health is fundamental to health. We have the support and the opportunity to uh, direct our own care. Um, not quite sure what your, uh, that, that's my recommendation and uh, different ways to realize that. Um, I think that's the important thing. I, I think that the opportunity, I'm talking about medical homes, for example, and the site of the The really revolutionary thing that's going on right now is person centered. That's the whole theme of kind of what's the, the transformation of healthcare that we're talking about. I was at a meeting that I want to go with Don Berwick from uh, the, the, the oh, administrator of uh, CMS. You know, he, he said, uh, I love how he put it, he said, you know, we, as providers, we have to remember that we are guests in people's lives. Uh, and, uh, and so so every so from that end, and we're emphasizing transformation, that's, that's really important, that person said. And if we build our activities around person-centeredness rather than disease entity, or discipline, or, uh, or uh, segmented uh, silos of this is substance use or mental health or uh, whatever, uh, I think if you, if you build it around person-centeredness, that's how you accomplish the integration mm -hmm. that takes place. Uh, disease entity, or discipline, or, uh, or Segmented uh, silos of this is substance use or mental health or uh, whatever. Uh, I think if you, if you build it around person centeredness, that's how you accomplish the integration mm -hmm. that takes place. Uh, and I love the point that, that Beth made as well, because I think that you know, primary, when we talk about primary care, it's important to remember that actually the fact is most care is self care. Right? Mm -hmm. way, you know? mm -hmm. Most care is self care. And so, so empowering that. From the beginning, empowering people to be active participants in the care, and active partners, and active uh, uh, to become knowledgeable, I think is crucial for us to do that. Make sure that uh, CMS um, begins to create filling codes against uh, which people's time using these um, clinic based decision support technologies 
is web applications um, uh, can uh, can be uh, reimbursed for, for time spent in in that uh, uh, effort to become educated, and activated, and empowered to participate in our care. That that's a, that's a reimbursable service, and that the government can take a lead role in the development of these um, decision support tools because um, industry has no role in the creation of these tools. It must not. recognize that uh, we, we still don't know enough and need to know more uh, to optimize uh, treatment. We need to know more about mental disorders. The, um, uh, I think it, it's not enough, I need a star D or DSM-4 to say that meeting DSM-4 criteria to major depression on the one hand, does not define a very homogeneous group, and on the other, uh, the, the, does not uh, predict treatment response, and does not even mean necessarily a person should go on medication, but that's one of the best uh, diagnostic tools we have today, but we, we uh, need to know more of what these uh, <coughs> disorders are, uh, and we need new treatments. And all right, all right. So my recommendation for primary behavioral health in the primary care setting is that we examine the evidence base because the STARD trial of antidepressants showed that only 3% of people actually benefited from a regime of antidepressants as we currently prescribe them. Once, and I know that the, the actual claims of benefit were higher, but once you actually look at the, the stated outcome data as compared to the, the secondary outcome data, which was what was reported, and 10% of all people that enter a primary care doctor leave with an antidepressant prescription, and 75% of those people don't have any psychiatric diagnosis at all. Yet, a recent study came out that said that if people that had depression were given placebo to start with, only 20% of them relapsed. Yet, if they were given antidepressants to start with, then 40% of them relapsed. So, it's, it's quite possible that we are doing much more harm than good with our current paradigm. And I think we need, if we need to strongly re-examine this idea that everyone who suffers emotionally has an illness. And I think we need to look at emotional distress mm -hmm. versus sure. disease. And I, need to, I think we need to say, look, these things are painkillers. They're not a specific antidote to a, a disease that has never been shown to have genetic evidence. So if we're talking distress, then we can talk painkillers. But like painkillers, then there comes a point at which we need to say a painkiller is addictive, it's dangerous, and it needs to be given short And not to use heavy machinery. <laughs> and there's a lot of evidence for, for, for short-term use. I've got a paper in the other room about uh, uh, use as needed in antipsychotics. And seen. I just videoed her whole <laughs> thing. Thank you. We're going to.